it is my pleasure to introduce the panel. All right, we have Jennifer uh, Sixkiller, the Health and Human Services Librarian at UNC Wilmington, and she is going to lead a body-based mindful intervention, as she does with her instruction sessions on campus. She will discuss transitioning mindful programming into mindful library instruction for credit-bearing courses, and her research, which aims to show the effectiveness of mindful practices in reducing library research stress or library anxiety. We also have Chris Robinson, uh, Outreach and Engagement Librarian at UNC Wilmington, and he will present about how he incorporates mindfulness in programming in his academic library, as well as how this practice has positively helped students and staff. Elisa mm -hmm. Coates, the part-time assistant at the New Hanover County Public Library, is presenting how she includes mindfulness in her work on libraries and professional conferences, including a chair yoga exercise to demonstrate how easy it is to incorporate into an office or a library setting. And not last but not least, Jennifer Smith, who is the reference and instruction librarian at Alamance Community College. Um, and she will lead a, uh, present a, about a series of mindfulness workshops that she provided to her campus and lead the group in a practice to uh, use music to make breathing meditation a little easier and more fun. All right. Thank you. Welcome, good morning. I'm so grateful for each of you for taking the time um, to come here and to learn and to practice. So we're gonna begin with the practice. I'm gonna sit, but you can also stand and do this. So I'm just gonna bring the chair out here a little bit. This is called, uh, well, it's my adaptation from the soles of your feet practice and a body scan. So we're gonna put the soles of our feet flat on the floor. We're gonna make any adjustments to our seat so that we can sit for a few moments really without disturbing ourselves or others. Is the volume of my voice okay for everyone? Can you hear me? If you can't hear me, raise your hand. Awesome. <laughs> okay. So I like to close my eyes because it helps me center and ground. If that's not comfortable for you, maybe just lower your gaze to the floor. You can place your hands on your lap or just hang them down to your sides. If it feels comfortable to place the palms up, that um, shows receptivity. And let's just take uh, three breaths together to kind of ground and center. Inhaling through the nose, spine is nice and tall. Exhaling out of the mouth, shoulders dropping away from the ears. Another nice inhale and release. One more intentional breath cycle together. And just feeling how that breath is landing, how the energy might be buzzing or spinning and directing it down to the soles of your feet. and paying really careful attention to what your feet feel like in your sock or shoe, the pressure of the feet on the floor, maybe pressing the right toes and feet down and then the left, and noticing if any feelings are coming up about the feet. We're not judging here, we're simply noticing. And slowly drawing your awareness up your legs and to the knees. And feeling the pressure of your seat, your sitting bones, your thighs against the chair, if you are sitting. Just noticing if there's any place you've scanned your body so far that is carrying any tightness or tension, pain or discomfort. Guiding the energy and the breath to that place, creating a little bit of space. Focusing on the torso now, the organs, the stomach, the belly, 
Just notice what's going on there. Coming up the chest, just noticing the rise and fall with the natural rhythm of your breath. Scanning the shoulders. A lot of us hold tension here. If you're noticing any discomfort or tension, just send the breath. Breathe into that space. And sending your awareness down the arms and into the hands. Noting any tingling or coolness, any warmth, sweatiness. Maybe you don't really feel anything at all, just noticing that too. Scanning the neck. Noticing if you're holding any tightness or tension, or if it feels loose. Scanning the face. And bringing the rest of the head into your awareness. We're going to scan down the back body. Just taking a minute, giving the breath any place that needs extra attention. Scanning back down the trunk, torso, scanning the legs, going back down to the soles of our feet. Taking one nice deep breath in, the whole body together. And on the out breath, we're gonna release the practice. We're gonna wiggle fingers and toes. Might wiggle your nose, slowly open your eyes, taking your time and just coming back into the room and just notice how you feel. All right. Thank you for that. Helps me just as much as it does you. So why mindfulness? Um, We've got four main uh, focuses here that we want to talk about today. Um, The first one is reducing stress. You know, as simple as a deep breath, let that go. Because in library settings, we all know, and I'm sure we've all been in some high stress situations. Um, The second reason that we're going to focus on today is that um, mindfulness enhances concentration. So it improves focus needed for effective studying, for research, and just for being present at work. Um, It also boosts emotional well-being, so it aids in mental health and resilience, and fosters a positive community. And so really what we mean by that is as I care for myself, as I can learn tips to help me be calm, then I invite the space for others around me to also be calm and to be mindful. So I like to go into what's the difference between mindfulness and meditation, because even in um, the health and medical literature, which I'm now um, becoming well versed in, it gets conflated. Um, and there's a thousand definitions of mindfulness. The one I go by is um, according to John Kabat-Zinn, who's considered to be the father of the modern uh, Western mindfulness movement. There are nine tenets and tools of mindfulness, and those are beginner's mind, curiosity, gratitude, acceptance, non-judging, non-striving, trust, patience, and letting go. 
and you can Google John Kabat-Zinn and, and find that. I didn't want to take up the slide and put it on here. Um, and according to the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, mindfulness means maintaining attention or awareness of the present moment in a non-judging way. So truly, it's a state of being as well as modalities to get you there. And so what is meditation? Well, a lot of times I think when we think of meditation, we think of like a Buddhist monk, someone who has to be still and quiet. You might have to use a cushion, um, but that's actually not the case. So meditation is a variety of practices or modalities which aim to integrate mind and body, calm the mind, and enhance well-being, so to bring you to mindfulness. And in the health and human services fields, um, they call a practice an intervention. So in other words, it's something that's introduced to bring about an aspect of healing or change. And some examples of mindful interventions are, we just did one, um, guided body scans, um, guided breath work, uh, guided visualization meditations, um, progressive muscle relaxation, sound healing sessions, and yoga, which we'll do here in just a bit. So as a public librarian, mindfulness showed up for me in creating a weekly program for the public and a separate weekly program for my staff, April. <laughs> um, exploring many secular modalities of mindfulness. And it was really important to me, even though for me, mindfulness is a very spiritual practice and I have my own spiritual practices, um, to really share uh, the secular benefits in, in the work setting. Now, I did, I did have a, a, a follower, a group of followers who were coming regularly to my um, public library program, and I asked them, I was thinking about introducing the chakra system, and they were like, we don't care, do whatever, we'll, we'll come to your class, which is okay, but we had to develop that rapport first before I felt comfortable stepping out of that, um, that zone. Um, so what that looked like was I booked our programming room every Monday for one hour and I would intersperse chairs and yoga mats with meditation cushions in a large circle. Um, I dimmed the lights and I called the program Mindful Mondays. After the first se session, which did not keep participants engaged, it was like an epic fail, but I learned a lot from that um, because it was too long. It was like uh, about 30 minutes and it was solely, uh, solely focused on breath work. And I didn't do much guiding. I just said, you know, I'll do something every five minutes. And like, that was a fail. Um, so what I ended up doing was landing on a 20 to 25 minute program. And I used my voice um, or my sound bowls to keep participants guided through the session. So we did, a, we did some body scans, we did some, a um, lot of guided visualization, they liked that, and uh, some sound healing, that was great too. Um, and so I started uh, the programming because it was a project component of me being accepted into the NCLA Leadership Institute, and so um, this was 2018. And it was successful, a weekly program, until the library leadership decided it was finished. So it ran from 2018 through the end of 2021. And of course, you know what happened in March of 2020. Um, I pivoted in the pandemic and I took the program to our library's Facebook page and I hosted it as a, as a live event. Um, I, I, did, I did rehearse and I did practice a little bit, but mostly I just kind of did this and like went live. So I um, did have a much bigger reach that way. Um, so as long as your leadership is supportive, it can be incredibly impactful for yourself as the practitioner. I can definitely say that it has been for me and the patrons and the staff that you're serving. Um, with my library staff participants, we get to take it a little bit deeper because we establish trust um, and interest in exploring topics related to emotional well-being. And so some of our sessions um, ended up being more interactive, like a classroom style, rather than just a guided session. And I would introduce some brief book chapters after, um, you know, realizing people wanted to go deeper in certain topics. Since transitioning from public libraries to academic libraries in 2023, I wanted to find ways to retain the impact of practicing and leading mindfulness in a different setting. 
And I do thankfully um, get to do a lot of lovely work with Chris, our outreach and engagement librarian, who's the steward of the mindful space on campus called Retreat at Randall on similar types of programming as I did in the past. And these are um, mindful sessions open to faculty, staff, and students, um, and they're in the retreat. We've done, I think, seven or eight different ones so far since I've been there for the year. Um, and additionally, I've always been interested in research, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna start here. So after a literature review on mindfulness and students in academic libraries, of which there are decades of research, there's like millions of um, articles and studies. But what I found uh, so far as like the types of mindful, um, mindful activities that they're doing on campuses, the body-based ones had way fewer adverse side effects. So just to give you an example, I think about 8% of the population experiences adverse side effects when they go to um, have therapy. And that was showing up about the same 8, per, eight to 10% of students practicing breath-based mindfulness were showing about 8 to 10% of adverse side effects. And it was like 3% with, with body base. And I was like, okay, this is great because it dovetails nicely alongside my own personal mindful experience in that times of duress, I tend to disassociate. So this grounding body-based approach is the most accessible for me and most helpful for me. And so I'm the most fluid and the most comfortable being able to lead others in this type of practice. And I don't need a script and I don't really need to rehearse because I've had so many years now of experience doing it. Um, and the last thing that I want to touch upon um, is that I noticed there's a gap in the research regarding mindfulness and library anxiety or research stress, specifically regarding library instruction. I'm talking I can count fewer um, than five that I could find doing a deep dive in all kinds of different databases. So there's a gap. So this is where I come in. <laughs> so my, the, my methodology I started doing I created a Likert style questionnaire um, asking students their perceived levels of stress before I go for an information session. And I use Mentimeter.com, which is a real time polling software. So it's anonymous, but that students can see how many people in here are feeling somewhat stressed, how many feel moderate stress, how many are like really stressed. And then um, I asked the same question again at the end. And so I offer these mindful interventions every other class I teach so that the control is no mindful experience and just an instruction session. And then um, I don't know how long it's going to take me to um, get enough uh, data to be able to say, is mindfulness affecting stress in a library instruction session? But that is the hope. That is the goal. Um, so being able to set quantifiable indicators um, used to evaluate and intervene in emotional well-being, creating emotions as a metric for research, a very valid one, um, highlighting the importance of emotional needs. So this is one of my whys when asked why mindfulness. And now I will hand it over to Lisa. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, and I can tell that this is going to, uh, I, I was talking a lot about moderating, uh, modifying, and because the room is so full and the chairs have arms, we are going to be modifying already, I can tell. Um, in uh, 2019, Jennifer Six Killer uh, actually approached me to collaborate on um, the first Zenden at NCLA Biennial Conference. And I had just come from an ACRL, uh, which is the academic end of uh, ALA. Or a group, and they had it was in Cleveland, I think, and they had a whole floor with tables with mindful activities, and they had a room that had like yoga. I mean, I was so impressed. I was like there most of the time, <laughs> instead of where I should have been. Not really. um, but I was super impressed, and she asked me shortly after that if I would go in on helping her with the Zen Den. And I loved this idea, and I had all kinds of ideas, and we did a really nice um, uh, representation of, of a Zen Den at that first uh, 2019 biennial um, NA, I mean, uh, uh, NCLA conference. Um, but then uh, COVID hit, and we had to do it online and modify flexibility. You know, I had to, I had, couldn't go to the conference. Jennifer was there in person. 
Um, but I decided to go ahead and do it online. So I did two chair sessions of yoga online and it worked really well. There mm -hmm. were people in, in person, but there were also people online with me, with us all. And that was great. And then we were able to boost the Zen Den for the 2023 uh, biennial. We had more uh, sessions. We had uh, Chris Robinson did a mindful tea tasting, which he's going to talk about. Uh, Marcellus Joyner did a full scale uh, mat uh, yoga session. Um, I did chair yoga, and Jennifer did her her other um, her mindful uh, meditation. So it was really it was really a great thing. We had all the tables filled with things that we you know people could do during the session. There were. Um, cushions that we had acquired and mats that were there and people could use them there at the conference um, throughout the conference and it was just it was a really it's it's I'm so excited to keep doing it um, so we really love doing that um, and then just kind of, and I guess the reason I, I'm talking about this is because I think the profession can use this you know I think we can all use this and that's what this when when this came up with this topic for the um, for the NC Live, I was like, oh, this is great. I really want to be a part of this. Um, so the other practices, like just briefly, when I was at UNCW way back, like 13 years ago, we were doing things that were mindful then. It's, you know, colleagues would take mindful walks, breaks, you know, or, or have meetings with walk, walking, doing things that were just thinking about the body and moving and mindfulness. Um, we read things in the profession that were coming out about mindfulness in libraries. Oh, yeah. Um, books like that, uh, things that came out. Um, these, these are fairly recent, actually. So some of the stuff we were doing was earlier than this. Um, but we would read a chapter, read the book, come together to talk about it. Um, sometimes just two people. Sometimes it was a small group. And then the university started focusing on mindfulness um, at some point probably around COVID, um, but also a little before that, because I remember a little before COVID, we were doing some things. And there was a uh, an app that the university got us all, um, we could all get access to. And so we would come together on Fridays at 2 o'clock, whoever wanted to come, whoever needed it or wanted to or had the space. And we would come together and do uh, either a little chat about it or we would do an actual meditation together or a mindful activity together. So that was really great. Um, so those are some ways you can do it just with your staff, you know, the people who are, who are in your library. But you can also, you know, move these into programming. And that's, you know, what uh, public libraries have been doing this and academic libraries have been doing this for for years. And so I have some of the, some of my colleagues will recognize some of these because we've got Susan DeMarco doing yoga story time. She's been doing that for years um, with children. But she also did a session for librarians in the area in Wilmington, um, downtown at the library on the third floor. And I used to go to those. Um, so she would do that for library staff, for anybody who wanted to come. And it was so great. Um, we have read to a dog, and that can be very, very mindful, just like the dog petting here is going to be. Um, mindfulness Mondays, which Jennifer talked about having a mindful or Mondays too, and that we do that uh, at the Pine Valley. And then there's the Wilmington Silent Book Club, which I think is like the newest thing, but I did find out from some colleagues that it's actually not so silent. Um, it, it apparently has turned into a, a per, bit of a social club, like people really talk and, you know, and so I think some people just wanted a way to get into um, with m like minded readers and not necessarily have to read a book and talk about a book and have a moderator, you know, so it was it's I don't know what's going to happen with the people who really wanted some silent time to read. They may have to have a real, real silent and then a social silent book club. Uh, but that is happening at our library. Uh, there you go. And a Wilmington silent. I think that's going to have to happen. Um, so, yeah, so that's just, I, I was talking about this with a colleague on um, Monday when I was there, and she said, it's not too silent. <laughs> so I talked about it. Um, so I'm going to do a short practice with y'all today. Now, I see most people don't have a lot of space to do some of the things I was going to do, so I'm going to modify. Um, but I'm going to pull my chair out here, and if everyone can kind of just pull themselves to the front of their chair, so just kind of a little bit where you're able to, yeah, she's got it right here. Um, feet flat on the floor, and I'm doing this to also show you, it's gonna be short, very short, and this can be, you know, I usually do about 20 minutes is about what I do. 
Um, I can do longer, but that's about the extent of people's, you know. But this is going to be four to five minutes, so it's really short. Um, but I want you to just kind of focus on your feet, sort of like Jennifer had you do. And we're just going to take a couple collective breaths, in through the nose and out through the mouth. And your hands can be anywhere on your thighs, up or down. Let's take one more. Okay. And now we're going to take our hands, and most of you cannot go to the side, so you're going to go up as, as best you can just to get your hands up in the air. Come down to the palms to the thing, to the, your uh, chest. Let's go up one more time. And let's come down to the side. So go to the right or the left, whichever is more comfortable for you, and just kind of pull your little a side twist, just a very light side twist. Deep breathe. It's very important to breathe into the movements. And then up with the in-breath, and to the other side. up. Okay, and bring your hands down. And let's, let's take our, our le right leg, so we're all on the same leg. Let's take our right leg and kind of just pull it up as best you can, as far as you can, and do some little twists with your, and if you have a skirt on, just kind of, you know, move it in a little bit. <laughs> uh, that's the other thing is you have to modify sometimes. Twist your ankle. And then if you do, if you can, put your ankle on your, on your knee. If you need to, you can cross your leg, because those of us who ha might have skirts on, or just comfort level. We're going to lift up. You're going to kind of engage the abdomen. Take a deep breath, and then lean forward as far as you can, just comfortably. Take a deep breath in there. That's getting your hip, breathing into the hip. And then breathing up and gently placing it on the floor. Let's readjust, engage the abdomen, take the knee up on the left side, do some little twists with your ankle, and then place that wherever you can on your leg, crossed or over the knee. Lift up again, engaging the abdomen helps support the back and move forward as far as you can to stretch into that hip, that left hip. Breathe. And then breathe up and release the leg. And we're going to do one more collective breath all the way up with our hands all the way up and coming down. Peace be with you. And so Lots of other things can be added to that. But, you know, as, as, as you're doing these things, you can definitely do, you know, modified ways. But for me, movement and, and breathing help me a lot to just stay in the moment. And you can do that at your desk, at your chair, you know, before you do something. So that is all. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, as mentioned before, my name is Chris Robinson. I'm the Outreach and Engagement Librarian at UNCW. And first, I want to express gratitude um, for everyone being here today. Um, you made the decision to be in this session. And so I want to honor that and, um, and say that I'm truly thankful for you all being here. Um, but also, I want to extend um, appreciation to Lisa and Jennifer for uh, facilitating their uh, mindful practices. Um, at this moment, I, I feel very relaxed and rejuvenated, um, and I hope that you feel uh, some form of that as well. And um, looking forward to this Jennifer's uh, practice <laughs> that is coming up shortly. Um, so now I invite you to journey with me um, as I share with you how we integrate it mindfulness practice at uh, Randall Library.
So as you see here, welcome to Retreat at Randall. Uh, Retreat at Randall was established in spring 2022, um, and it is dedicated to the memory of uh, the late Ann Pemberton, a former UNCW librarian uh, who was passionate for mindfulness, uh, student success, and uh, overall well-being. Um, although Ann wasn't able to see the space come to uh, its creation, um, her legacy lives on each time um, someone steps into that space and is transformed. Um, in honor, I mean, I am honored to serve uh, as a steward of the space, as Jennifer mentioned earlier. Um, and the space is a sanctuary alongside um, working uh, with, in tandem with Jennifer, uh, but also um, with other mindfulness uh, facilitators and practitioners. Um, and the retreat was uh, envisioned as a haven for mindfulness and well being practice. Uh, and it is intended for contemplation, meditation, yoga, reflection, and prayer. We also host uh, occasional mindful and wellness events and programming uh, within that space. Uh, the space is designed with uh, biophilic principles. Uh, the retreat incorporates natural elements such as wood, sand, plants, um, to create this calming environment. It is a unique space that is tailored to a uh, holistic well-being and providing users with the opportunity to self-regulate and then be able to carry on with their day. Um, and at UNCW and in Randall Library, we believe in supporting the whole person by offering, offering them mindfulness tools and other resources as they, um, to accompany them on their academic journey. So in the re uh, retreat, there's a host of amenities, um, including two treadmill desks, uh, a yoga area, cocooning chairs, um, and additional mindfulness resources. The space is available to faculty, staff, and students 24-7, and they can access the space with their uh, one cards. And the space is also in partnership with um, UNC Mindful, which is a, an initiative um, that has been on campus for a while. And then also uh, Campus Recreation, the Counseling Center, um, and uh, UNCW's other initiative called Healthy Hawks. And additionally, in this space, you can find uh, grounding kits and what I affectionately call uh, the one brain cell uh, activities. Mm -hmm. And so those activities would include like things like puzzles, bracelet making, uh, books, rock painting, and things like that. So now we're transitioning into uh, the programming for the space. And so, as I mentioned um, uh, just a little while ago, uh, we do mindfulness programming, but also we do active programming, which is kind of like the, the practices that you uh, just witnessed, but then we also do passive options, which I'll sh uh, share with you um, in a moment. But as on the slide, you can see there are some examples of the different programmings, um, programs that we do in the space. But then also you can see um, in this picture here, that is um, a student that is uh, leading a origami class. This one over here is faculty and staff engaging in mindful tea tasting. This is a student just using the space um, for her needs. This was a program over here with the counseling center about gratitude. And uh, this is campus recreation doing a yoga session. And so, um, here, I want to spotlight two mindfulness programs that um, were very uh, successful for me. And so uh, I want to start with the flagship um, program, which was called Mindful Tea. And so um, like uh, Lisa has mentioned, like, I was able to do the Mindful Tea session uh, at the uh, um, NCLA uh, conference and had over 40 participants. And typically at UNCW, I do this uh, session for about 15 people. So in that moment, I literally had to uh, pivot and say, OK, <laughs> how are we going to make this work? I'm only one person. So what I did is, is just I split the room to two different sides and I just made sure that I engaged both sides and just tried to keep both um, on the, the same 
um, tasks. But um, just to tell you a little bit about the Mindful Tea, uh, it is a session uh, that offers an introduction to mindfulness practice um, and intentionality. Specifically designed for beginners, participants engage to fully um, or are encouraged to fully engage with the present moment by slowing down and focusing on each step of the tea making and drinking process. And additionally, prompts are provided to help participants express their experience, um, their experience they are having in the moment. And then secondly, as like the picture here, um, origami with Charlie, uh, this uh, emerged as a student-driven initiative, and um, Charlie is uh, very um, good in origami. And she, uh, her parents are stationed in Japan. So she spent a lot of time in Japan, learning culture, and also working on her or origami skills. And so she, um, student at UNCW, and uh, at that time, the dean of the library was uh, down in the Office of Military Affairs, and uh, she ran into Charlie sitting at the um, student worker's desk, mm -hmm. just making a bunch of paper cranes. And so um, the dean, she came back and told me uh, that she had met Charlie, and she felt like this would be a good, uh, reach out to Charlie because this could be a good fit. So I reached out to Charlie, and then that's when I learned her story um, about her parents being in Japan, and, um, and her using origami as her grounding techniques. And, um, and so I was like, wow, this could be um, a really good moment for peer-to-peer -peer engagement. And so I um, worked with Charlie and um, offered her the opportunity to host her own sessions uh, within the retreat at Randall. And um, this provided for her uh, one that she can share um, her talents with um, her peers, but then also gave her an opportunity where she did regular classes and, um, and created her own instruction and all these things. And so I told her, it's like, these are legitimate classes and things, you can add this to your resume. Mm -hmm. And, um, but then like working with her, she did about, I think eight sessions for me. Um, and she would do them in the, the evenings from like six to 8 p.m. And so normally whenever we would do our sessions, they're typically earlier in the day, either noon or three to four. And so we know that we were missing a later demographic. And so Charlie, as a student helper, was able to uh, help get the, the, the late night or the early evening uh, people. And so um, with that, it also helped, again, um, not just uh, Charlie interacting with her peers, but it also helped with peer-to-peer -peer marketing for the retreat mm -hmm. space as well. And so now I want to uh, spotlight to a passive program that I just recently completed. Um, and it is called uh, Mandela and Harmony. And this is, was part of my NCLA uh, Leadership Institute project, uh, where I collaborated with a art and history um, graduate student and, uh, named Gina. And as you can see, uh, Gina's here. And what I asked Gina to do, or we collaborated together, I told her that I wanted a community project, or art project, but I didn't know exactly what I wanted. I first was thinking like a mural um, or something, but then we landed on uh, drawing a mandala on plexiglass and having uh, the UNCW community to come help fill it in. And so um, the program, it started in March and ran through April and it was every Wednesday. And I would drop the mandala off in the retreat um, on Tuesday evenings and it would stay in the retreat all day Wednesday and then I would pick it up on Thursday morning. And um, by the end of April, it was about 80% completed. And so after that, it ran into um, exam time and we do a student exam event. So I said, this is a perfect opportunity uh, for the mandala to be completed. And so the, the mandala was finished at the um, retreat 
uh, me at the recharge, and you can see here um, how it's filled in. Currently, uh, there's some refinement work that needs to be done, so the artist is going to pick it up and um, do the refinement work. But then um, the students and faculty and staff who participated, um, they were able to fill out a uh, survey uh, with their name, their information, department, or uh, major. And then that's going to be a nameplate that goes along with the, the mandala. And we're going to hang it somewhere in the library. Um, and uh, for me, this, um, uh, for me, this uh, is a representation um, of the dedication that Randall Library has towards mindfulness. And so, so in summary, um, this is just how a little bit of the work that I've done um, and um, just sharing how mindfulness is woven into the fabric of um, Randall Library. So that's all that I have um, at this moment. So now I'm going to hand it over to Jennifer and um, she's going to share all the wonderful things that she's doing at Alamance Community College. Everybody. So again, I'm Jennifer Smith, uh, Reference and Instruction Librarian at Alamance Community College. And I'm going to talk about um, mindfulness, mental health, and building community. Um, and creating sort of a mindfulness uh, programming where I work. So why mindfulness programming in a community college? Uh, part of it is my uh, personal interest in practice. So I uh, took a mindfulness-based stress reduction class at Duke, at Duke Health in the fall of 2020. So I've had the time, because the world was ending, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I really got into it, have read about it more, have taken lots of classes. So that it's my own personal interest in practice. I also wanted library outreach, community college, everybody's busy, everybody's working and taking classes and this and that. And so to have the library's name on this, to put it out there that we're doing this and we care about this is part of that. Um, collaboration with colleagues. So we teach a chair yoga. And our director of wellness and student support is a certified uh, yoga instructor. So she was able to do that. Uh, a big part of it also is that our QEP for our next accreditation round, our quality enhancement plan is mental health awareness. And the students ask for that. Mm. So for academic libraries, it's a big deal. Every 10 years, you go through a big reaccreditation. For the next five years, what you're really going to focus on is your QEP, and that's mental health. And we're very um, practical about it. You know, we're not going to be able to solve all these problems. I think a lot of what we talk about is the awareness piece. So I wanted to use my skills and my interests and share that with my community. I feel like at a community college, I feel this is very much about equality. Like I used to work at a private university and they had all these things. I really want to bring this to my students because I think they deserve these things too. So the past year to sort of get it going, I've done monthly series. We did chair yoga twice by demand and these are actually for faculty, staff and students. So the whole community can come. I've done meditation basics. Uh, really about creating your own practice, what it really means to meditate and how that relates to being mindful. We did gratitude and Thanksgiving, around Thanksgiving. Uh, and talked about the Surgeon General's idea of connection. Uh, we did some guided meditations. I brought in some pretty stationary and I had them write a letter to someone they'd never thanked before. And that ended up being a really powerful thing. Um, I've done music and meditation. I intentionally um, put Beyonce on my poster to get some people there, and it worked. <laughs> the uh, nail tech instructor brought her whole class. Um, and then a couple weeks later, I went and supported them and got a $4 pedicure. So, um, and, you know, sometimes I would tell people, oh, well, all the nail tech students came, and some people would kind of laugh. And I'm like, but they deserve that too, and it's a very stressful program, and they're learning about how to deal with student, with people, and work with the public, and pleasing people, and taking care of themselves. So, and when I went and got my pedicure, the student was like, "Oh yeah, you're the one with the cats." So, <laughs> <laughs> they remembered me. I think I, what I say is, I live alone with a couple of cats, so meditation's easier for me. So <laughs> she remembered that. 
and I did cultivating calm is what I called it. It was really some techniques for anxiety because I had done an anonymous survey of participants and they asked for help with anxiety. And April was Stress Awareness Month. So we talked about the stress versus anxiety, when it can become a problem, and that kind of thing. So I've done anonymous surveys just of the people that have come, just to try to get a gauge on good times of day, because I'm getting participation, but not tons. And you know, it, I see it as a building up to mm -hmm. getting more. Um, one student quote was, the session showed me interesting techniques for calming and meditation, and now I have them, and now I can use them on demand, which is exactly what I wanted them to get from that, so that helped out. <laughs> uh, we're renovating our library. Hopefully, knock on wood, if the furniture comes, we'll move in this summer. We'll have an awesome library. We'll have... Um, Low sensory rooms, we got a grant to outfit a low sensory room. We're going to have a high flex space where we can have people in person and on Zoom at the same time. And I have envisioned like yoga in the library, people in between the stacks. We're going to be able to do all kinds of things and further collaborations. So, you know, community colleges really is of the community and everyone feels like it's their campus. So we can have other staff doing things, we can have students doing things. So I really think. This past year has just been a building up to this being more and more. So we're going to practice two. And one of the things I did was music and meditation because I, for me, sometimes I need quiet. Like in the morning, I don't want to hear anything. I just want to meditate on, on the afternoons. Or, you know, sometimes you can use music to help. And a lot of my best teachers have used music to help. So what we're going to do is breathe mindfully. If you want to sit up, again, put your feet on the floor, kind of rest your hands. Again, close your eyes if you feel comfortable with that. If you do not, if you kind of close your eyes and it, you start to freak out, just look at the floor. You don't want to be focused on what everyone else is doing. So either close your eyes or focus on the floor. And we're going to play this piece by a beautiful chorus called Inner Peace. And what you're going to do is breathing in and out and focusing on that breath because that's how meditation helps you be mindful. It's more of a practice. Your mind is going to go all over the place. You're probably thinking, well, what are we going to have for lunch? And what did she say before there? And, oh, wow, there's a boat on the river. That's what our minds do. The practice of meditation is to come back. Your mind goes blah, 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 blah. I heard someone just made a noise. We're coming back to the breath is the practice. That is how we do it. I know, you know I hear a lot of people say, I just can't meditate. Mm -hmm. It is hard. It does take practice. But I, I don't think anybody just sits and zone out, zones out for hours at a time. That's not how our brains work. So when your mind wanders, that's okay. Realize it. Come back. And use the music mm -hmm. as a tool to help you come back to that. So this is four minutes. We're going to play this song and have it be a tool to help us breathe.
you want to kind of open your eyes a little bit and move around and that's sort of a taste of how I use music to help with meditation when necessarily quiet is not helpful. Um, so this is us again our slides are available and I think we still have time for questions but also comments. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, if was, if there's anywhere that we could find uh, how to set up a tea to find a focus of program where um, so um, pretty much, yeah, you can uh, just do a Google search. Uh, you know, the most popular one I've seen is Mindful Eating, and so I kind of adapted uh, the Mindful Eating, but you can do it. Um, with anything. The whole point is um, intentionality and being in the present. And so I chose tea because as I, um, a lot of times we speak with those processes, you know, it's just like just hurry and want to consume. Um, but then it's like when you stop to really slow down and really examine the process, uh, and then not only just the process up to making the tea, but actually consuming. Um, but yeah, I would say start with um, like just looking up like Bible eating and like exercises and things like that. And then um, once you decide like you want to do a program and things like that, then just reach out to me and we can have a conversation. My question was about the tea as well. Mm -hmm. So hot tea are you talking about? Like with yeah. hot tea. Like tea leaves? Right. Okay. So supplies wise, um, cups, um, lids. Uh, hot water, tea bags, uh, sugar, honey, you know, those additives. But the thing is, everyone has to do everything. So um, have all your supplies out in front of you, and then as you're facilitating, we'll say, okay, now put your tea bag into the water. Now tell me um, what has happened. And usually that's when, you know, it started to steam, and you can see the color change. Okay, thank you. You well. I had a question about the manual. What was the scale? Mm -hmm. Um, I want to say it was, I'm not sure the exact size, but if you're looking at this four here, uh -huh. so it's yeah, this about here, here. here. Like four okay. by six, maybe? Yes, yeah, something Four like feet that. by six feet? Yeah. yeah. That's a great use for all the good and plexiglass we have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And what did you, what this was the um, medium that you used on the acrylic paintings? Yeah, I have a children's library who's interested in her certification with yoga, so she can incorporate it into story time, which our last um, children's librarian did as well. So I wanted to know about certification um, with all of you and courses required to lead um, meditation and yoga practices in the library. Well, I can speak to um, mindful certification. You don't have to have any. Um, there's a lot of programs out there. I was looking into a program specifically tailored for um, college students. It's expensive. Uh, I spent all my uh, professional development money, but so that's something I'd like to pursue in the future. But I'm self-taught, and I've you know from books, from apps, from yoga classes, you know all the all the things, and I just started experimenting. So, and I, I can, I, I don't have to call yeah. myself anything. I just call myself the mindful librarian. So I don't think there's great certification for mindfulness. There is for you. Yeah. And all the mindfulness stuff is super expensive. Yeah, yeah. and I was just gonna say, I'm not actually certified with you. I've been doing yoga since undergrad, so for years. 
but and so I just incorporate the things that I learned from my teachers you know from the people that I and I don't teach a ton I do this chair yoga and I do you know some small things but I know like Susan DeMarco is certified like so there are people who are and if I was going to do like a full-scale program I would probably want to get certified okay that's my, my and a lot personal. of yoga studios will certify yeah. you and if it's I was like a thousand dollars or something I just want to throw this out there about Jennifer. She also spent time with the person. And so that has uh, oh, yeah. formed a lot of her uh, experience and experience yes. as well. Yes. He's cool. <laughs> Go live in the desert. <laughs> I heard a lot of people speak about the gratitude programs. Can y'all speak more about what exactly the gratitude program looked like? For me, it was I came in and did a guided meditation that talked about gratitude trying to remember and then um, I actually bought a mindful looking stationery it was really pretty because the uh, Surgeon General has a big website about connection and a big part of that is connecting with other people through saying thank you so we sat down and wrote letters to someone we had thanked before so like uh, my director thanked someone who baked her a cake when she left her last job and like it had been 15 years and she'd never said thank you and it was some, obviously something weighing on her. Um, another student actually wrote a letter to her father who passed away. Another student wrote letters to her family members and had them addressed with stamps on them before the class ended. So um, that I, even though, you know, it, it's about connection really with the Surgeon General, but I, I, you know, I would recommend that, you know, and say at the beginning, I'm not a therapist. If this brings right. up a lot of stuff, yeah. Sorry, I can't help you with that. I don't know. But it was, everyone liked it, so. Not a question, just a suggestion. I just started reading a book called Breathe In, Breathe Out by Stuart Sandman, mm -hmm. and it really plays into what you're all talking about, how breath is important to everything we do in life. And it doesn't matter if you're secular or religious or whatever. It's got a lot of good ideas in it, so it's librarians I like to read about things, so this is a really good book to run your list. So. I will say when I do mine, I like have the lights low. Um, I brought it, but I didn't do it today. There's something called Chill Pill. It's a spray, and I kind of spray a little mm -hmm. bit because I'm trying, like I had the poster before, a digital detox zone. I'm trying to create a space that's not the rest of campus, which is everybody's on their phone and this and that, and there's, you know, it, and that's what people are craving. That's why they're coming. So you kind of walk into a cooler, darker space. It smells different. We're kind of, I'm speaking softly. I think people are craving those spaces. And also accessibility. So like for me, I like to say in my beginnings of things is that the one, it's new. Oh. <laughs> mindful breath in and one mindful breath out is a meditation. Like just mindfully breathing one in and one out. And that's that's all it takes. It's like how long is that? Not even thirty seconds, really. You know, so so that's what I'd like to start with is because people feel like they have to Boom for a hundred yeah. hours, you know, and no, really don't. But and we want to say thank you to all of you guys yeah. for cramming in here and taking yeah. our class. Yeah. Yeah.